Thanks so much, Aaliyah. Uh, it's such a pleasure to introduce Dr. Siri Su, who comes to us today from Brandeis University, where she's an assistant professor of sociology. So Dr. Su uh, got her PhD in sociomedical sciences from Columbia University in 2014, and before that, her master's in public health in 2004. Um, and her approach to global reproductive health comes both out of her training and expertise as a social scientist and on experiences that she had herself as a public health worker in the NGO sector in Senegal in the 2000s. Uh, her research on maternal and reproductive health um, has been funded by numerous institutions, including the American Association of University Women, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Social Science Research Council, and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Dr. Sue's work takes an ethnographic approach to obstetrics and maternal health in Senegal, a country where abortion is illegal. In her many articles, and they're just such a you know, fantastic body of scholarship, uh, Sue shows how in a context in which abortion is criminalized, not only is safe abortion unavailable, but also the anxiety surrounding abortion and its legal status profoundly shape the everyday practice of obstetric medicine. Uh, so one of the things that really kind of stands out to me so much from reading this work is how these seemingly everyday kind of quotidian decisions about the delivery of healthcare, um, you know, how to label a, a medical case, for example, in a record, or which tool or, or kind of technology should be used in a medical procedure, become much more than clinical decisions, but also become decisions that are implicated in reproductive political struggles stretching from the global to the local levels. And the results often are very catastrophic for, for African women seeking health. So Dr. Sue's work is both fascinating and extremely urgent, and I'm so grateful that she's here to speak with us about it today. Um, so her talk today is, come, is about her forthcoming book, which is called Dying to Count, Post-Abortion Care and Global Reproductive Health Politics in Senegal. And that will be coming out with Rutgers University Press this spring uh, 2021. So please join me in welcoming Professor Siri Sue. There are normally good applause right here, but <laughs> you can imagine we're all clapping. <laughs> I'm just gonna share my screen. All right, I'd like to begin by thanking the African Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for inviting me to discuss my book in press on post-abortion care and global reproductive health politics in Senegal. The research I'm discussing with you today was conducted in Senegal. The image on this slide is of a midwife at a public hospital in Senegal using a plastic manual vacuum aspiration or MVA syringe to administer post-abortion care to a patient. But much of this work is relevant to other contexts in Sub-Saharan Africa where post-abortion care or PAC is purportedly available in hospitals and where the US is a prominent donor of family planning and global health aid and where women face an incredibly high risk of injury or death, whether they terminate their pregnancies or carry them to term. Hmm, I, for some reason, am, am unable to advance. Oh, there we go. So I'm gonna jump right into this. So let's begin by unblack boxing, what we mean by post-abortion care. What is it? Where does it come from? And what does it actually do? So in this talk, talk I'm gonna describe what post-abortion care entails as a reproductive health intervention. And I'm gonna locate it within multiple regimes of global reproductive governance within the mid 20th century. I'll talk a little bit about how this intervention came to be implemented in Senegal, as well as my own professional involvement in Senegal's PAC program during the mid 2000s. Mid 2000s. I'll describe what it means to provide post-abortion care in government hospitals and what it means as a woman patient to receive this care within a context where abortion is, all, is prohibited altogether. Then I want to talk about how post-abortion care has come to be understood as a successful maternal mortality reduction intervention. I'm interested in the kinds of data that post-abortion care generates about the kinds of abortions that are treated in government hospitals and about the kinds of technologies that are used to provide these services and how these data convey post-abortion care's effectiveness as a reproductive health intervention, despite a lack of rigorous evidence, statistical evidence that post-abortion care reduces abortion-related um, mortality.
Medical anthropologists use the term reproductive governance to understand the ways in which governments, NGOs, religious institutions, and other actors monitor and regulate reproduction. This can take place through national legislation around abortion or contraception, or through global treaties, like the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development, or ICPD, the, the Millennium Development Goals, the 2015 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Many of you have likely heard of the 1984 Mexico City policy, also known as the Global Gag Rule, which requires NGOs in foreign countries to sign a document agreeing that if they receive US family planning aid, they will not use funds from other sources toward abortion related activities. And the global gag rule has been an immensely influential form of global reproductive governance and the role of the United States, one of the most generous donors of global reproductive health aid. The US accounts for about two thirds of all family planning um, aid. Now, reproductive governance unfolds through the production of standardized demographic indicators, such as the maternal mortality ratio or contraceptive prevalence. National governments and NGOs are evaluated and rewarded and at times shamed by the extent to which they are meeting or missing national and global benchmarks. The United States, for example, is the only OECD country where maternal mortality has been on the rise in the last few decades. Now, when it comes to the maternal mortality ratio or indicators related to the performance of interventions like post-abortion care, we have to pay attention to what these indicators are revealing or obscuring about a particular dimension of reproductive health care. Medical anthropologist Claire Wendland, for example, has argued that in countries like Malawi, the maternal mortality ratio reveals very little about the actual technical environment in which health professionals administer delivery care. Yet, declines in Malawi's maternal mortality ratio purportedly signal advances in maternal health care that in turn convey competent population stewardship on the part of health officials and other politicians. So reproductive health indicators are multivalent. They serve multiple purposes, not all of which necessarily center women's health dignity and safety. It's important to understand the geopolitical origins of post-abortion care. Post-abortion care is connected to three main global regimes of uh, reproductive governance, starting with uh, population control, right? And this was a regime that started in the mid 20th century in which demographers, economists, and development planners urged the need to curb population growth in the global south. High fertility was understood as an impediment to economic growth and high population was understood to uh, pave the way to political instability and environmental degradation. Population control in the form of contraception was promoted as a technical, medically controlled magic bullet solution to this problem. And the US Agency for International Development, or USAID, distributed not only um, contraceptive technologies uh, to countries in the global south, but in some countries, they also distributed abortive technologies like the manual vacuum aspiration syringe. Now, the distribution of abortion technologies came to an end in 1973 with the Helms Amendment, which prohibited uh, foreign assistance from being used for, quote, the performance of abortion as a method of family planning, end quote. In 1987, the Safe Motherhood Initiative called for greater attention to the problem of maternal mortality in the global south. This was one of the development indicators with the greatest disparities between wealthy and low income countries. The Safe Motherhood Initiative argued that the focus on fertility reduction promoted by the population control paradigm was entirely too narrow and that the global health community had to invest in pregnancy and delivery care, and not just in large urban hospitals, but also at lower levels of the health system. Several years later, in 1994, 179 countries signed the program of action of the ICPD, which recognized reproductive health or well-being as a human right. The ICPD uh, rejected top-down targeted oriented approaches to fertility reduction and argued instead that comprehensive approaches to sexual and reproductive health that centered women's needs were key to economic development.
The post-abortion care um, model was conceptualized by reproductive health NGOs in 1991. So right between the Safe Motherhood Initiative and the ICPD, it entails emergency obstetric care for complications of spontaneous abortion, also known as uh, miscarriage or induced abortion, followed by family planning counseling and service provision to delay the woman's next pregnancy. Now, in the aftermath of the 1984 global gag rule, post-abortion care was understood as a harm reduction approach to, approach to the problem of unsafe abortion. It rendered complications of abortion a clinical manner to be managed by health professionals rather than a legal or moral issue. The PAC model called for safer, more effective, and less expensive methods of abortion care. Instead of using sharp curatage, also known as dilation and curatage, PAC providers were trained to use the manual vacuum aspiration syringe, which can be used by mid-level providers at lower levels of the health system. The ICPD called on governments in countries with restrictive abortion laws uh, to ensure the availability of quality post-abortion uh, care as a public health measure to reduce maternal mortality. PAC was thus codified as an intervention grounded in reproductive rights. PAC is the only abortion-related intervention that is exempt from the global gag rule, and the USAID has provided support for PAC up to at least $20 million in 40 countries since the early 1990s. And there are currently between 50 and 60 countries with PAC programs worldwide. Senegal has been dubbed uh, the, the post-abortion care pioneer of West Africa because of how it decentralized PAC services from large urban hospitals to district hospitals in rural areas. Senegal's penal code forbids abortion under any circumstance and an estimated two thirds of induced abortions are unsafe, meaning that they happen in an unhygienic environment or with an unskilled provider. After piloting post-abortion care in several urban hospitals in the late 1990s, the Senegalese Ministry of Health began to introduce the intervention to hospitals at lower levels of the health system with the support of international NGOs. Management Sciences for Health, an international health NGO based in Massachusetts, contracted with the USAID between 2000 and 2006 to support the Ministry of Health in improving maternal health and also in, increase, in increasing contraceptive uptake, up, uptake, which included the introduction of natural family planning methods like the standard days method cycle beads displayed in the bottom right corner. Keep in mind that this is happening during George W. Bush's presidency when the global gag rule had been reactivated. Now, starting in 2003, MSH supported the decentralization of PAC in five of USAID's regions of intervention throughout the country. I worked with MSH during this time and provided support to the monitoring and evaluation team for post-abortion care. I was also involved in piloting the cycle beads in USAID's regions of intervention, but that's a story for another day or perhaps even um, during the Q&A session. The, the previous approach to treating abortion complications involved doctors using sharp curatage in the operating theater. The PAC program train, trained midwives to use MVA to treat abortion complications. And so this was happening not in operating theaters, but in delivery rooms, and in some cases in separate rooms for MVA. The data from these hospitals showed the clinical and public health impact of post-abortion care. More women were being treated with MVA, hospitalization periods post-treatment were declining, patient costs were declining, there were fewer complications following treatment and midwives were comfortable using MVA. My research on post-abortion care in Senegal occurred several years after my work with Management Sciences for Health over 19 months between 2009 and 2011. So this was during President Barack Obama's administration when the global gag rule had been rescinded. I conducted in-depth interviews with health workers, health officials, NGO workers, and other important stakeholders. I observed post-abortion care services and reviewed post-abortion care records at three hospitals around the country. I also studied news paper accounts of women who'd been hospitalized for complications of illegal um, abortion and review cases of abortion that 
were prosecuted by the state in the region of Dakar between 1987 and 2010. Post-abortion care was conceived as a form of public health harm reduction in response to global anti-abortion funding mechanisms like the global gag rule and restrictive national abortion laws. But my observations in hospitals revealed the imbrication of violence into this care that ensured women's survival. While the term obstetric violence can refer to the hyper-medicalization of pregnancy and delivery, I explore how it unfolds more broadly in substandard and neglectful treatment of women, particularly low income women and women of color during any kind of reproductive health care. We can consider under medicalized birth as a form of obstetric violence when women are unable to access life saving drugs, blood supplies, or surgeries. We can also interpret restrictive abortion laws, which abandon women and low income women in particular to resort to unsafe procedures as a form of obstetric violence. When suspected of illegal abortion, women, were, women often endured the humiliation of what is widely understood among Senegalese health workers as l'interrogation, the, the interrogation, during which they would ask questions at times in full view of everyone in the delivery room about how, when, and why the pregnancy loss had occurred. Health workers described to me how they would at times try to keep women at the hospital if they believed she'd had an illegal abortion. Some said that women were threatened with the withholding of care until they revealed what happened. When there's pain, a nurse told me at the second study hospital, women will talk. Health workers were more likely to suspect young, low income and unmarried women of illegal abortion and would amplify their efforts to question the patient or what they would call pushing the interrogation. For example, while treating a woman who'd arrived at the hospital unaccompanied, health workers continued to ask her about the whereabouts of her husband. Now, why do health workers interrogate women? Why do they attempt to determine whether the patient had a miscarriage or an induced abortion? They are concerned about the very real possibility that the police may catch wind of the case and come to the hospital to investigate. Now, I want to emphasize that these kinds of practices do not just happen in countries like Senegal. They happen wherever abortion is highly restricted. Historian Leslie Reagan has described how in the United States, prior to the legalization of abortion upon request in 1973, doctors used to elicit what were known as dying confessions from women who were being treated for complications of illegal abortion. They would lead women to believe that they were on the verge of death and pressure them to reveal who had done the procedure. This newspaper report of a case in 2011 involving a woman who is, uh, this, is a, this shows the newspaper um, um, account of a case in 2011 involving a woman who had been arrested for illegal abortion. She received an abortion from a nurse at a hospital in another region of the country. When she began bleeding profusely, she sought care at a district hospital and was evacuated to a larger hospital in Dakar. Suspecting an illegal abortion, the doctor called the police after uh, two days of treatment and, and observation, she was transported to the hospital um, ambulance to the police station. In a case prosecuted by the Regional Tribunal of Dakar in 2009, a physician called the police after a young woman presented at this facility with complications of abortion. The police came to the hospital, interrogated the patient, and subsequently escorted her to another facility where health workers conducted an ultrasound and concluded that she had attempted an abortion. And what we see here is the report from that ultrasound. Sometimes the police receive anonymous tips about suspected illegal abortions. In another case prosecuted in 2009, the police arrive at a district hospital within two hours of being tipped off about a patient who was being treated for complications of illegal abortion. After conducting a bedside interrogation of the patient, the the police requisitioned a medical report from the attending physician shown here, which concluded that she had terminated a pregnancy. According to the police report, she confessed to the police that she had swallowed a homemade infusion and was eventually sentenced to six months in prison. Now the possibility of arrest may discourage women um, from seeking care 
a recent study conducted um, in Senegal estimated that up to 42% of women with complications of induced abortion do not receive treatment and low income and rural women are disproportionately less likely to receive care. National and global abortion policies shape the provision of PAC in hospitals in ways that give rise to obstetric violence. USAID provides funding to train health workers in MVA, but does not support the procurement of MVA because it, uh, it is an abortion technology. Recall the 1973 Homs Amendment, which forbids the application of funds toward abortion as a form of family planning. In Senegal and other countries with restrictive abortion laws and post-abortion care programs, health managers and hospitals must procure MVA on their own. Now, international NGOs have donated supplies, especially during the early stages of PAC programs, but these sources eventually vanish, leaving hospitals and health systems to figure out how to purchase and distribute the syringe, which is the preferred post-abortion care technology. The national prohibition on abortion engenders MVA policies that aim to prevent the, mis of, the misuse of MVA for illegal abortion, but that ultimately prevent the misuse um, or that ultimately reduce women's access to quality post-abortion care. For example, the MVA is one of very few medical items that can't be procured through the national medical supply system. At the time of my research, a national reproductive health NGO, which was headquartered in the capital city, was responsible for the, the procurement, sale, and distribution of the syringe. So hospitals in need of a new syringe had to send a representative to Dakar, receive a stamp of approval from an official in the Ministry of Health, and then purchase the syringe at the NGO's offices. This burdensome procedure delayed the timely renewal of MVA syringes, thereby contributing to the presence of malfunctioning devices in daily obstetric practice. Hospitals enact their own rules to prevent the abuse of MVA technology. Although she had several MVA syringes in her office, the gynecologist at the second study hospital permitted only one MVA syringe to circulate among the four among four shifts of midwives. The midwives complained bitterly about the state of the syringe, saying that it didn't work most of the time. To make it work, they spread vitamin E oil over the head of the plunger, which was wrapped in medical tape to facilitate its movement in and out of the barrel of the syringe. Delays in care occurred as midwives disassembled and decontaminated the syringe after each use. At the third hospital, the head gynecologist restricted MVA services to weekday morning and weekday mornings and afternoons when senior physicians were available at the hospital to, to supervise the use of the device by junior physicians. Patients who arrived at night or on the weekend were treated with other methods, such as dilation and curatage or digital evacuation, which is displayed in the image on the bottom right. This procedure was often performed without um, medication and at times without gloves. It is not a method of abortion care that is recognized by the World Health Organization, yet has been documented throughout Sub-Saharan Africa in health facilities that lack MVA or providers that are trained in MVA. I just talked about how organizational and clinical practices and legal frameworks give rise to violence or harm against women. I'd like now to discuss how strategic measurement practices related to post-abortion care may perpetuate bodily and structural harm against women. I spoke earlier about how numbers and indicators can convey certain facts about what happens in hospitals. An increase over time in the number of women treated and of course the proportion treated with MBA conveys the favorable public health impact of post-abortion care. Other facts about PAC services are collected in hospitals, but these data may be strategically overlooked as a way of maintaining the political legitimacy of an abortion-related intervention like post-abortion care. And some traces of PAC provision are omitted altogether from the record. The table on the top uh, right-hand corner shows in um, three of the hospitals where I observed PAC, that almost all PAC cases were classified as spontaneous abortion. Now, this is not unusual. 
um, health workers in countries with restrictive abortion laws may be reluctant to disclose that they've, pro uh, that they've provided um, abortion or treated complications of induced abortion. Many of the health workers I interviewed indicated that they prefer to record suspected uh, cases of illegal abortion as spontaneous abortion to avoid initiating a police investigation. These record keeping practices were grounded in health workers beliefs that they were primarily responsible for addressing the clinical management of abortion complications rather than the legal implications of clandestine abortion. A midwife at the district hospital at a district hospital explained to me, even if the, if the patient had an induced abortion, it's not my problem. The obligation of a midwife is to care for the patient. In the short term, these practices may protect women and health workers from police intervention at the hospital, although the, the newspaper stories I shared earlier suggest that providers don't always have control over how the police learn about a case of illegal abortion being treated at the hospital. In the long term, these practices portray pack patients as women who've experienced the miscarriage of a presumably desired pregnancy, thereby reinforcing abortion stigma discriminating attitudes and practices toward women who are suspected of having procured an illegal abortion. While patient interviewing is a standard part of uh, medical practice, the discriminatory elements of l'interrogation that give rise to abortion classifications and that are out of step with PAC's ethic of harm reduction are not captured by the record. At an institutional level, these interpretations, uh, these interpretations of the kinds of women that are treated are reproduced by decisions about routine data collection across multiple levels of the health system. Although health workers specify abortion type, the Ministry of Health does not necessarily collect this information, focusing instead on the number of cases treated, the proportion treated with MVA, and the proportion uh, who received family planning counseling and a, me and a method. An official in the, in the Division of Reproductive Health in the Ministry of Health explained to me, we're not interested in the type of abortion because we're not here to crack down on women. We do not differentiate in the collection of data. We look at abortions that took place within the first three months that benefited from MVA. So post-abortion care offer a sanitized account that frames the intervention as the one that is primarily concerned with saving presumably expectant mothers. Omitted from this account is the poor quality of care that, it, that can be experienced by women regardless of whether they've experienced spontaneous or induced abortion or the difficulties encountered by health workers as they try to provide care within a context where abortion is altogether prohibited, prohibited by strategically obscuring information about the frequency of induced abortion and about what happens in gynecological wards, PAC data narrow the scope of bodies, experiences, and identities that matter enough to count in reproductive policy making. Strategic measurement practices also shape the portrayal of the technical management of PAC cases. When I interviewed PAC records at all three study hospitals, I found that over time, MVA became the most frequently used method of uterine evacuation. Yet, at all three hospitals, health workers continue to use digital evacuation to treat um, PAC cases. The graph at the bottom right shows data from 2010, and we see that digital evacuation accounted for over 37% of PAC cases in the first study hospital, 26% in the second hospital, and 13% in the third hospital. These are all facilities authorized to use MVA and staffed with health workers trained in MVA. More recently, a 2016 national report of obstetric care estimated that 73% of health facilities had MVA. Now, while these data are encouraging, they say little about how how many functional MVA devices are available at each facility or the proportion of patients that continue to be treated with digital evacuation. Health workers very carefully document which method they use to treat their patients, but it, it is the numbers on MVA and not digital evacuation that are collected by the Ministry of Health taken up by NGOs and donors in national and global valuations of post-abortion um, care these are the numbers that matter most in conveying quality of care, in conveying that post-abortion care works and is an effective maternal health intervention.
For example, reports of post-abortion care in Senegal published in 2008 and 2014 by the NGO Evidence to Action, which was funded by the USAID, do not acknowledge other forms of uterine evacuation beyond MVA in hospitals. In a global review of 20 years of post-abortion care evidence published with support from USAID in 2016, there is no mention at all of digital evacuation. Sorry, I'm, I seem to be having problems advancing my slides. What's going on here? Okay. In 2018, the, Lance, the journal The Lancet Global Health published an assessment of PAC, cases, of PAC services between 2007 and 2017 in primary and referral level facilities in 10 developing countries. The study found significant gaps in health systems capacity to offer basic and comprehensive post-abortion care. For example, in seven out of the 10 countries, less than 10% of primary level facilities excuse me, could offer basic post-abortion care, including uterine evacuation. Now, Senegal was included in this uh, study and uh, the Senegalese data appears in the third column from the right. Um, and Senegal demonstrates really good indicators with respect to uterine evacuation. So 84% of primary care facilities and 86% of referral level facilities reported the capacity to conduct uterine evacuation. These indicators, however, don't distinguish between the kinds of uterine evacuation techniques that are practiced um, at these facilities, MVA, sharp curettage, or digital evacuation. Since the introduction of post-abortion care in the late 1990s, Senegal has experienced a modest decline in its maternal mortality rate. Although health managers can assess the quality of care offered to women by post-abortion care programs, it is quite challenging um, uh, to determine the impact of post-abortion care on national estimates of uh, maternal mortality for one th of maternal mortality redu reduction. For one thing, women receiving post-abortion care in hospitals represent just a fraction of women in the population who have experienced abortion. Additionally, mortality and morbidity related to induced abortion may be classified as miscarriage or something else altogether. Despite a lack of rigorous statistical evidence of post-abortion care's effectiveness, the strategic deployment of certain PAC indicators, the number of women treated and the proportion treated with MVA ensures continued financial and technical support for post-abortion care in a global health landscape where donors want to see numbers to use the number, to, to use the words of medical anthropologist, Noelle Sullivan, that go up. The invisibility of techniques like digital, and, digital evacuation and l'interrogation must be situated within an, a neoliberal landscape of global reproductive health governance in which some indicators are privileged over others in the portrayal of maternal health care and in which donors increasingly privilege the development of ever more sophisticated estimates of maternal mortality over strengthening health systems. The imperative to demonstrate rising PAC indicators it, indicators is revealed by a recent commentary in the Lancet Global Health that cites recently documented gaps in PAC provision around the world as evidence of missed opportunities in women's health and urges policymakers to increase the provision of PAC. So more PAC. Critical scholars of global health have argued that health professionals and medical authorities in developing countries negotiate multiple numerical truths as they strategically manage metric uncertainties and inconsistencies to demonstrate the legitimacy of their work and to maintain accountability to national and global health priorities within a transnational policy landscape that has rejected safe abortion from maternal and reproductive health mandates. I argue that Senegalese health experts have very pragmatically interpreted data on hospitals capacity to save women's lives as evidence that something is being done about maternal mortality and morbidity in Senegal. They have enabled the ministry to comply with the ICPD's framework for rights-based maternal mortality reduction while adhering to the national abortion law. 
These metrics demonstrate the intervention's compliance with and eligibility for the anti-abortion funding of the government's, one of the government's primary reproductive health donors, the USAID. Post-abortion care is included in the USAID's population policy and reproductive health sector, which is the fourth largest sector of USAID funding in Senegal, receiving $16 million in 2016. Despite a lack of statistical precision, these metrics have been understood as and perhaps fetishized into markers of progress and impact that have been rewarded through additional technical and fiscal support for post-abortion care technologies and services from international donors and NGOs. Since the late 1990s, the Senegalese government has secured post-abortion care programming and contracting with at least nine international NGOs. Through these indicators, national and global PAC stakeholders, to use the words of medical anthropologist Cal Baruch, see exactly what they want to see even if these accounts are profoundly incongruent with the clinical realities of PAC for health workers and patients and suppress political will to revise a discriminatory abortion law. If life-saving PAC services are in place and most PAC cases are related to miscarriage, then there is little need to revise the abortion law. While PAC's contribution to maternal mortality reduction may be difficult to quantify, global health experts have long been aware of the public health impact of safe legal abortion. Very little abortion mortality occurs in countries where abortion is broadly legal. Data from the developed world, so countries like the US, England, and Sweden, suggest that access to safe abortion leads to declines in abortion mortality. More recently, declines in abortion mortality have followed abortion law reform in developing countries like Nepal. Data from the developing world indicate that restrictive abortion laws do not reduce the, in, the incidence of abortion. Abortion rates in the, develop, in the developing world have remained unchanged, while those in the developed world have declined. Restrictive abortion laws simply increase the risk of unsafe abortion. Most mortality from unsafe abortion happens in the global south where laws tend to be stricter. There are regional inequalities in the risk of dying of unsafe abortion. So while Latin America has a higher incidence of unsafe abortion than Sub-Saharan Africa, women in Sub-Saharan Africa face a risk of death from unsafe abortion that is 15 times higher. And as devastating as these numbers related to uh, mortality may be, they represent the tip of the iceberg as the epidemiological burden of mortality is even, of morbidity is even greater. Every year, nearly 7 million women are admitted to hospitals for complications of unsafe abortion. Restrictive abortion laws disproportionately affect low-income women who lack the resources to procure, to procure discreet safe abortions um, or fend off charges of, of homicide after having experienced miscarriage. In Senegal, up to 32% of women in prison have been convicted of infanticide or abortion with sentences ranging from several months to years at a time. And with safe abortions costing up to $375, it's primarily young, single, and low-income women who resort to unsafe clandestine um, procedures that frequently result in complications and, at time, criminalization. Through the threat of withholding family planning aid, the global gag rule aims to reduce the incidence of abortion in developing countries, but actually has had the opposite effect. Data from Sub-Saharan Africa show that the odds of having an abortion increased two and a half times during periods when the global gag rule was in place. By withdrawing family planning aid, the global gag rule deprives NGOs of funding and resources that would be used to prevent unwanted pregnancy. And while the, stat the statistical impact of post-abortion care on maternal mortality and morbidity may be difficult to quantify, the costs of post-abortion care on hospitals, health systems, women and their families have been well documented. An estimated $232 million are spent every year in developing countries on post-abortion care in sub-Saharan Africa alone. 
um, the cost of post-abortion care is estimated at $117 million a year. PAC is also more expensive than safe abortion. A study in Zambia, for example, found that women pay two and a half times more for post-abortion care than they did for safe abortion. In Senegal, the average cost of PAC in 2016 was about $25 uh, per patient. And this is a significant economic burden, considering that the legal minimum wage is under a dollar. And patients cover up to 20% of health system um, post-abortion care costs. In the face of decades of evidence showing that legal abortion reduces abortion-related mortality and that PAC poses a tremendous financial burden on health systems in developing countries, the intervention staying power in global and national reproductive health policies illuminates the disposability of women's bodies in achieving the targets that matter in global forms of reproductive governance. That low-income women and women of color around the world face the greatest risks of poor reproductive health outcomes as a consequence of such policies demonstrates the race, gender, geography, and class inequalities of global reproductive governance. PAC has been framed in the language of reproductive rights and safe motherhood, yet it represents a profoundly stratified system of global reproductive governance that withholds affordable obstetric care from low-income women in Senegal and other countries where abortion is legal restri legally restricted until after they have resorted to unsafe procedures, and then at times punishes them in hospitals for transgressing gendered expectations of motherhood with threats, humiliation, and poor quality of care. Seemingly benign measurement practices reinforce these inequalities by obscuring what happens and who is treated in hospitals and how. While these practices secure support for PAC as an effective maternal health intervention, they foreclose opportunities to revise the abortion law and improve obstetric care more comprehensively. I want to be clear, I'm not calling for a termination of PAC or other harm reduction strategies related to maternal health as long as abortion laws remain strict and abortion stigma remains high, there will be a need for post-abortion care. And the need for post-abortion care under these conditions applies to wealthy countries in the global north, as well as low and middle income countries in the global south. For example, in 2015, Anna Yoka was taken to an emergency room in the state of Tennessee here in the United States after she used a coat hanger in an, in an attempt to terminate her pregnancy of 24 weeks. With Amy Coney Barrett's nomination to the Supreme Court, we may see an intensification of abortion restrictions through which post-abortion care may become the new normal of abortion care for the most marginalized women in the United States. I advocate for a commitment to reproductive justice that critically situates post-abortion care within multiple and contradictory regimes of national and global reproductive governance in which various actors, including government health authorities, aid donors and NGOs are motivated to achieve goals that are not always aligned with women's needs and interests. PAC's capacity to keep women alive does not mean that we should not be critical of how interventions that are, in the words of medical anthropologist Gordon Rowe, better than bad, may foreclose opportunities for reproductive justice that put women first. I call for a critical engagement with the racialized and gendered entanglements in the government governance of reproductive health and resulting health outcomes between the global north and south. Trump signed the global gag rule in 2007, 2017, three days after taking office. The global gag rule claims to act in the interests of mothers and of course the unborn fetus. In reality, it is a political stunt that compromises the ability of women in developing countries to access contraception, which in turn can lead to unsafe abortion. Similarly in the US, anti-abortion and anti-contraceptive legislation complicates access to reproductive health services primarily for low-income women and women of color. 
Black and Native American women who carry their pregnancies to term continue to face disproportionately high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity. And this is in line with a long history of policies and discourses that have framed women of color as bad mothers, irresponsible and overabundant breeders, and less deserving of quality maternal and reproductive health care. Policymakers and other stakeholders must be held to account in how they interpret data related to abortion. Policymakers in countries like Ethiopia and Mozambique and Nepal, for example, relaxed abortion laws precisely because they were studying the burden of um, abortion complications in maternity wards. Now, law reform doesn't immediately translate into reduced mortality and morbidity, but it's an important start. And the rationale for keeping expensive services in place when affordable, more affordable options are possible should also be examined. More generally, there's a continuing need for critical examination of numbers and indicators in global reproductive health. What motivates the selection of some indicators over others? Which numbers count? Should we look, be looking at whether numbers are going up or down? What are we missing with our measurement practices and what can we do better? And finally, um, a reproductive justice approach demands that our measurement practices and policy choices ultimately center women's needs, comfort, safety, and dignity, and confidentiality when it comes to um, when it comes to reproductive health care. And I will very. Very shamelessly end with a um, uh, plug for my book, which will be published by Rutgers University Press next June. Please contact me for a 30% discount if you purchase the um, book on the Rutgers website. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. Um, so many questions, um, so many things to talk about. Um, so just a reminder, uh, people who want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand with the participant function um, uh, and I can call on you. You can also put in questions into the Q&A box and I see you've already got uh, a couple of questions there. So I will uh, read it out and then uh, professors who can respond and then we'll, we'll call on some others as well. Um, so we have a question from uh, Professor Jacqueline Bethel Mugwe. She, I'll just read it out. So she says, uh, thank you for this fascinating and informative presentation. Your research focuses mostly on PAC in medical facilities. I wonder if you were able to access information about PAC in other spaces and with local PAC methods. Also, might PAC be more acceptable than abortion in Senegal because of diverse ideas about what is considered real pregnancies? I think of the recent research in East Cameroon that examines how PAC in local contexts is influenced and shaped by diverse ideas about real pregnancies, which itself is shaped by fluctuating social and political conditions. Great, very interesting questions. Um, to address your first question, um, my research was um, conducted in um, government health facilities, so hospitals, some were um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, um, you know, uh, secondary level uh, facilities uh, with multiple operating theaters. Um, others were district hospitals at lower um, levels of the, of, of the health system. Um, so post-abortion post care is um, available in primary health care facilities, right, which do not have uh, which do not have um, operating uh, theaters and the regulations um, around what kinds of PAC procedures can be um, um, provided or administered in different kinds of health facilities have evolved um, over time. The Senegalese Ministry of Health has um, authorized um, the use of MVA in primary health care facilities um, now. At the moment of my research, uh, you know, nearly 10 years ago, this was, this was not, um, this was, this was not the case. Um, this is a really qu interesting question about, um, you know, at what point pregnancies are considered real or actual pregnancies. Um, you know, you'll notice that, um, I did not interview women 
um, as part of this study. I, I focused on health professionals. Um, I did not interview um, women who were coming into hospitals for um, post-abortion care. That was a methodological choice that I made in order to avoid, you know, kind of drawing more attention to women who were being suspected of having procured um, illegal uh, um, abortions, um, but certainly conceptions of, you know, when pregnancies are real or um, when ensoulment happens um, could certainly frame uh, or, or shape um, healthcare seeking itineraries. Um, thank you. And just a quick note, I think that I pressed a button that lowered people's hands. So if you had your hand raised, please raise it again. I apologize for that. Um, but we've got two more questions in the chat box. So I'll, I'll read them both out uh, in order and you can you know, choose the order in which you want to respond. Um, so we have a question from Sebastian Francois. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and the question is, did medical providers out of empathy protect women from authorities by stating they had suffered a miscarriage? And if so, does this change the way abortion is documented? Um, and then a second question, uh, this comes from Lynn Morgan. Um, thank you uh, for a fascinating presentation. Um, I wonder whether you've seen any overt opposition to PAC or MVA on the part of anti-abortion organizations that work at the international level. Thank you, both very interesting questions. Um, Sebastian is a student in my, taking my sociology of reproduction class this semester. I'm glad that you came. Um, so Sebastian asked about um, empathy and whether that affects the, cl the class, the recording practices. Absolutely, um, you know, health workers, um, part of their uh, reasoning, right, for recording uh, these cases, um, cases that they suspect uh, of being induced abortions as miscarriages um, is because they are interested in protecting women. One of the midwives um, at the second study hospital said to me, you know, um, and a doctor at the third study hospital said something similar to me that, you know, with the knowledge that, that they have of what women have to endure in prisons, um, it is very difficult for them to classify these cases as, as, as induced abortions. Um, so health workers are absolutely um, motivated um, by empathy for their, um, for their patients. Um, Lynn Morgan, hi Lynn, um, asked a really interesting question about opposition um, to post-abortion care and to MVA at the uh, global level. To my knowledge, um, post-abortion care has not mobilized um, a great deal of um, opposition. Keep in mind that the USAID uh, supports post-abortion care. Um, I would say that this opposition um, with respect to abortion technologies and, and post-abortion care um, might be more in play when it comes to misoprostol. Um, which is a, a, a pill um, which can be used to terminate pregnancy. It can also be used to treat complications of um, abortion and to treat uh, or, or prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Um, and there are, um, you know, uh, pro-life organizations um, that have um, contacted the World Health Organization, the WHO, in protest of the WHO's inclusion of misoprostol on the list of um, essential medications for reproductive health care. So they argue that not only does, you know, including misoprostol on that list, um, you know, kind of support substandard care for women in under-resourced countries, um, but that it also goes against their, uh, their, their beliefs about um, the location of abortion within uh, reproductive health services. Thank you. Um, I see a question um, from Susan Craddock. Um, uh, ditto what Lynn said, great talk. I want to follow up with Lynn's question to ask about organizations, movements, initiatives within Senegal that press against restrictive abortion laws. Great, hi Susan. Um, so the um, Association um, of Women Lawyers, uh, L'Association des Juristes Sénégalaises, 
in Senegal is one of the you know, leading organizations um, that has been um, mobilizing support uh, to revise the abortion laws, uh, the abortion law for many years. Um, they do advocacy um, with multiple stakeholders um, to inform people um, about the causes and consequences of unsafe, um, of unsafe abortion. Um, they provide legal services um, for women who you know, are being prosecuted um, with uh, illegal um, abortion. They work with um, um, various ministries and parliamentarians in order to try and harmonize the national penal code with the global and regional treaties that the Senegalese government um, has uh, ratified. Um, and so, you know, there, the, 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 this association is in, and also the Association of Women Doctors in um, Senegal has also been involved in, in, in this um, kind of, of advocacy. Well, thank you so much for your answers and for your questions. And I think we um, can stick around for a couple of more questions if, if Dr. Sue's available, but I do want to just note that it is one o'clock. Uh, so for anybody who needs to leave now, um, we'll make this kind of the official uh, end of the Africa at noon session. Uh, but again, I think we can stick around for a few more questions uh, if there are, are more, but thank you so much everyone. And um, it is one o'clock. Um, okay, we've got a question um, from Chris McCormick. Um, and the, uh, I'll read it. Um, I imagine confidentiality, fear of police involvement, and other factors make collecting reliable data a challenge. Were there any additional data that you wish you had available while conducting your research? Great question. Um, so one of the drawbacks um, to focusing my uh, interviews on health professionals, right, and, and choosing not to interview women, um, was that I was unable to, you know, look more closely at women's health-seeking itineraries and narratives. For example, um, to what extent were women already aware of which hospitals uh, to seek care at, right, with advanced knowledge, right, of certain hospitals being more or less friendly toward women who present with complications um, of abortion, right? So what kinds of knowledge exists within the community um, about the friendliness of, you know, certain hospitals? Certainly, you know, um, um, this kind of thing has been documented in Latin America, for example, where, you know, people are aware of which pharmacies are more or less friendly towards uh, dispensing misoprostol, right? Without asking too many questions, right? Or without requiring um, uh, prescription. Um, so um, I, you know, having a, a more insight on, you know, how women came to be, came to, you know, present at these particular hospitals, I think would have definitely uh, enriched, um, you know, my, my study and provided kind of a, a larger landscape of, of what it means to re um, receive post-abortion care. Um. If you don't mind, I'd love to ask a question. Um, so I, uh, this kind of builds off um, uh, Chris McCormick's question. You know, I, I was really interested in that vantage point of the health worker and the kinds of things that they could know based on both dealing with patients and also dealing with this larger kind of legal and funding landscape. And um, you know, I, I was really interested in the point that you were making about how some of these practices of you know how you label certain kinds of things in medical records that are meant to kind of protect from legal intervention. Um, they also the flip side is that it kind of can increase the stigma of abortion and, and kind of, you know, play into that politics in an unintended way, perhaps. Um, and so the question I have is about, um, you know, whether health workers are politicized around this issue, whether reproductive rights would be the framework through which they kind of think about this issue, or if there are different ways of talking about it, or is that something that they don't really talk about, you know, um, given the kinds of sensitivities around it? Right, great question. Um, 
I would say that, you know, the public health harm reduction model um, has been um, very effective in, you know, kind of motivating health workers to provide post-abortion care and to make them feel comfortable providing post-abortion care. I didn't talk too much about this during my uh, presentation today, um, but the, the introduction of post-abortion care, right, at, when the ministry, when the Division of Reproductive Health within the Ministry of Health um, was, and also, you know, um, members of the, the, the Faculty of Medicine at the, the National University, Université Sheikh Anta Diop, when they were trying to pilot post-abortion care at a number of select hospitals, first in Dakar and then in other um, larger cities around the country, it was very controversial because people said that post-abortion care was essentially the same as abortion and that by implementing post, introducing post-abortion care in government hospitals, that the Ministry of Health, along with its you know, NGO um, um, supporters, were essentially promoting um, um, de facto abortion in public hospitals, right? And obviously, the, if that was the understanding, then post-abortion care was very much at odds with the national abortion law. Um, so framing post-abortion care as a harm reduction approach, as a safe motherhood um, initiative was very much a way of getting everybody on board. Mm -hmm. Ministry of Health officials, um, parliamentarians, as well as uh, health professionals, uh, nurses, doctors, and uh, midwives who really understood post-abortion care as part of the rest of the maternal reproductive health care that they provided and they would describe post-abortion care in those terms, right? Post-abortion care is like any other service that we provide. But when we look at how they actually treat post-abortion care patients, and especially the ones um, that are suspected of illegal abortion, we see that, you know, that harm reduction model has not entirely mitigated um, the, uh, the, the legal context of in which post-abortion care is practiced, where health workers really are very nervous about implica being implicated in a case of um, in a case of illegal uh, in a case of illegal abortion, so the reproductive rights framework, um, you know, I would say that this is something. This is a kind of language vocabulary that is very much taken up by um, NGOs and people operating at the ministry level. Um, but in terms of the language that healthcare workers use, um, it's very much oriented around their role as medical, you know, clinical experts and the fact that they're not, supposedly not interested in what kind of abortion the patient has had. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Um, really, really interesting. I see one more question. Um, let's see. Um, so this is from Aliyah um, McCord. You asked us to consider what measurement practices and policy choices miss, noting that there are real consequences for privileging certain metrics and that these metrics often reflect donor priorities. You cited the example of MVA versus digital evacuation as an example of one such metric. Uh, can you expand on this? What other global health metrics do you believe deserve closer examination? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so manual vacuum aspiration, um, you know, in and of itself is, <laughs> is a contested technology or a contested, you know, kind of form of um, uterine evacuation, because it, it also, like most misoprostol, can be used as um, an abortion uh, technology. Um, so the focus on MVA um, um, in, in, in many ways is part of, um, you know, the ministry's effort to show that, you know, MVA is only being used for post-abortion care in hospitals. And look how, you know, the, the, the uh, number of 
you know, cases, post-abortion care, or the proportion of cases um, that's being treated with MVA um, is going up, right? As, 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 as part of um, uh, this life-saving maternal health um, intervention. And MVA has um, uh, gone up, right? MVA utilization has gone up um, over uh, the years. But the, the argument that I'm making is that this focus on MVA um, and, and the, the, you know, the lack of attention that's paid to other forms of uter uterine evacuation, um, especially digital evacuation. And this, again, this is not just unique to Senegal. Um, this is, you know, something, this is a digital evacuation is a technique that happens um, in other, you know, places where there continue to be barriers in accessing and renewing um, manual vacuum aspiration syringes, which technically have a shelf life of 25, right? They're supposed to be used up to 25 times before you have to renew them and get a, and, uh, and get a new one. Um, so the, the, the process of renewing and purchasing um, M MVA, which is the preferred technology, actually makes it very difficult for health workers to use um, this technology, yet the, you know, the need to demonstrate good MVA indicators obscures how important of a method that digital evacuation, you know, continues to be, right? It's something that health workers continue to use when, you know, they have to get through, you know, a, 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 a number of post-abortion care patients that have to be um, that have to be treated. So following you know, the proportion of cases that's treated with digital evacuation can illuminate um, the problems that health workers and hospitals experience in um, procuring this technology and you know, could possibly open up conversations about facilitating access to this technology, right? Um, and again, there have been changes in the policy uh, since I did my field work. So um, MVA is not, can be purchased um, from another, uh, this time an international NGO called um, DKT International. Um, and they, you know, the, so, so the, the hospital or health facility can purchase the MVA syringe directly from the NGO without having to get a stamp of approval from the Ministry of Health first. But um, when I talked with a representative of this organization, they revealed that um, when they, excuse me, when they first started um, distributing or selling MVA syringes that the Ministry of Health required them to send them a list of all the hospitals that they had sold an MVA syringe to, right? So there's still, um, you know, kind of a culture of surveillance um, around uh, MVA, which, you know, I argue drives this that kind of singular focus on MVA in terms of the, 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 the collection of data around uterine evacuation. Um, just to answer the other part of your, uh, of your question, what other global health um, metrics? Um, so medical anthropologists, uh, Dominique Bahag and Katerini Storing, Storing have um, you know, done a fascinating ethnography of the Global Safe Motherhood Initiative. Um, and they've talked about um, the, you know, kind of challenges that global maternal health experts face in collecting data, right, that compel donors, right, to give money, right, towards, um, towards uh, uh, maternal health interventions. And the maternal mortality ratio has become, um, you know, the most important indicator, even though, you know, it may not reveal everything, right, about what happens and, and may actually not capture a lot of death that happens. And so Storing and Bahag 
um, are interested in why the you know global health, the global maternal health community doesn't focus more on morbidity, maternal mor morbidity. So women who actually survive um, are actually greater in number um, than 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 the, the than the maternal deaths. Thank you. Um, do, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this is from Althea Anderson. Um, and she writes, uh, Dr. Sue, I appreciate your research helped us better understand the multiple ways in which PAC practice and, um, and measurement obscure women's identities, experiences and dignity and reproductive health care. I'd be curious to understand the role and influence of religious leaders in intervening in PAC and access safe abortion, both the level of policy and the norms related to the acceptability of safe abortion. Do you have recommendations of working with religious leaders around the acceptability of safe abortion? Great question. Hello, Althea. Um, so in, in some um, uh, contexts in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, NGOs and ministries of health have worked closely with religious leaders to increase the acceptability of post-abortion care. Um, in Senegal, for example, you know, during the early days of PAC introduction, and this um, you know, is relevant to um, the introduction and, and, and promotion of family planning as well, right? These interventions were framed with the you know, support of religious leaders, and I'm talking you know, both about uh, Islamic and Christian leaders within the context of um, um, Senegal, although Islam is the, the, the dominant religion in, in, in Senegal. Um, so the Ministry of Health and other stakeholders framed um, post-abortion care as a maternal health intervention, right? It was about saving mothers, right? Who were suffering complications of miscarriage and post-abortion care also, you know, kind of provided a bridge between emergency obstetric care and family planning as a way of birth spacing, right? So spacing her next birth so that um, she can be healthy and prepared for the for her next pregnancy when when it's um, when it's ready. So post-abortion care resonated um, with. Um, um, existing, you know, kind of narratives and discourses around um, around birth safe, birth spacing and um, preserving maternal health. As far as safe abortion is concerned, um, you know, the Ministry of Health and other stakeholders, um, I believe, are much more careful um, about. Um, the ways in which they frame safe abortion or the ways in which they engage um, religious, um, religious organizations or you know, religious leaders, many of which continue um, to be very much to speak out against um, abortion and to reject it as you know, part of the continuum of maternal and reproductive uh, health services. So, um, one of the members of the Association of Women Lawyers was telling me um, about how, you know, whenever her organization um, does some sort of, you know, kind of national sensitization around um, uh, safe abortion or medicalized abortion, and that's another tactic that the, um, this association has used um, to kind of re to reduce the stigma of abortion is to speak about it in terms of medicalized abortion and to contrast medicalized abortion in hospitals with health professionals from clandestine, underground, unsafe abortion. Um, so whenever they've done this kind of sensitization around the need to legalize medicalized um, abortion, they have you know, been matched with an anti-abortion campaign um, that's uh, done by, you know, one of the most prominent uh, Islamic uh, kind of or or organizations. 
Um, so, you know, the, the um, kind of advocacy around safe abortion is proving to be much more difficult and challenging than um, what stakeholders experienced when it came to post-abortion care. Post-abortion care is now, you know, kind of considered quite normal. It's old hat, right? Um, although I would argue that, you know, some of the same, you know, kind of challenges in terms of clinical provision of care continue to uh, continue to exist in, in government hospitals. Um, well, uh, please everyone join me in thanking Professor Sirisu for her talk today. Thank you. We have learned so much and I'm really looking forward to the book. And uh, thank you everyone else for attending. <laughs>